على أشرف الخلق أجمعين سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا أب القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله وسلم عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله وسلم عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا غريب يا مظلوم كربلاء يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم إن الله عليم خبير God states in the Holy Quran Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Humankind We have created you from a male and a female and we have made you peoples and tribes that you may come to know one another. Amanna billah, sadaqallahu al-aliyyul azim. Let us enliven our hearts and minds in our gathering with the remembrance of the Holy Prophet and his purified progeny. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. The United States is one of the most diverse nations in the world when it comes to its composition of people of various backgrounds, of various ethnicities, various origins, nationalities, cultures, religious persuasions. It's one of the truly unique places in the world in its diversity. And this is in many ways a unique, it presents a unique experience of diversity. One is able to see in most places across the nation, is able to see people who come from various backgrounds, interact with people who come from differing backgrounds and hold differing views and engage in differing practices. But on the other hand, this also presents an enormous challenge when it comes to relations between and among people of differing backgrounds, of differing cultures, of differing identities. And this is especially the case when it comes to the various religious traditions and the adherence to these religious traditions. And so the question that we'd like to discuss tonight, two questions, are number one, how can we conceive of relations between religions in the context of the United States and between adherents of various religions here? And the second question is, can we put forth an Islamic perspective on theological or religious pluralism? And so these two questions here, 
we're looking at two levels. One level is the social or the sociological level. As a matter of fact, there is diversity here. And what is the sociological or social relationship between people of differing backgrounds, especially differing religious traditions? This is one level. The other level is on the theological or the doctrinal level. Can we put forth a theology, a theory of religious pluralism from an Islamic point of view? And this, brothers and sisters, this discussion is a very complex discussion. We won't be able to exhaust this entire discussion in the time that we have together. But tonight, I'd like to focus on three points for us to think about together. The first of these points is that there is a need for inter and intra-faith harmony and understanding. Interfaith meaning between people of different faiths. Intra-faith meaning between people of the same faith. Different denominations or schools of thought or madahib. So the first point is that there is a need, there is an urgent need for inter and intra-faith harmony and understanding. Why? First of all, because whether we like it or not, there are those who use religion, they use faith, they use their religious identity or the identity of their sect or school of thought, they use it in a perverse manner, in a manner that is destructive to others around them. And unfortunately, this misuse of religion, this misuse of this religious identity, either beliefs or practices, this leads some people to have a negative view either of all religions or of all people that adhere to a particular religious tradition such as Islam and Muslims and so on and so forth. This is clear in the case of Islam. If we look at the United States public opinion regarding Islam, there are many surveys out there, many studies out there that tell us that the general U.S. public still largely views Islam and Muslims with suspicion unfavorably. Why? Because some people decided to, in the name of Islam, in the name of this religion, to do evil things, to co commit violent acts, to cause destruction, to oppress others. And so people, again, this is regardless of whether this is justified or not. That's a different case. But when religion is misused by some, this leads some people to have a general negative view. So here in the United States, in the case of Islam, for example, we are told that uh, the general U.S. public still views Islam and Muslims unfavorably. One study was conducted in which U.S. adults, American adults, were asked uh, to rate Muslims on what they called a feeling thermometer. So the more favorable that you consider Muslims and other groups, by the way, various religious groups, the more favorable you see that religious group, the higher the rating, you give them a, a warmer rating, like a thermometer. Muslims, according to this survey, they received a score of 48 out of 100 in a feeling thermometer, 48. In fact, Muslims out of all of the groups that were asked about, Islam and Muslims had the lowest rating, even beneath atheists and beneath others. We are told that about 40% of U.S. adults they consider Islam to be more prone to encouraging violence than other religious traditions. And that about 35% of 
U.S. adults, they think that there is either a great deal or a fair amount of support for extremism by U.S. Muslims. That Muslims in the United States, not in other parts of the world, that Muslims in the United States, they either have a great deal or a fair amount of support for extremism. These are some of the public sentiments regarding Islam and Muslims. And so there are those who misuse religion causing people to misunderstand religion and religious adherence and thus have a negative view of them. This is number one. Number two is that there are many Muslims themselves who have misconceptions of other religions and people who belong to other religious traditions. It's not just one way. Yes, Muslims are subjected to Islamophobia, to anti-Muslim sentiment, to misconceptions about their beliefs and their practices and their identity. But many Muslims also have misconceptions about others. There are many Muslims, for instance, who assume that all Christians, they worship three gods. Some Muslims, they believe that all Christians worship three gods. Or some Muslims, they believe that all Christians are not required to be good or moral. Why? Because Jesus died for their sins. So because Jesus died for their sins, this means that they don't need to be moral or ethical anymore. Some Muslims believe this about Christians. Or we have some Muslims who believe that all Jews are Zionists. That if you're a Jew, automatically you are a Zionist. And you support certain types of oppression, for instance. And even within Islam, even amongst Muslims, within themselves, towards other Muslims, you have Sunnis who have misconceptions about Shi'is, and vice versa, Shi'is who have misconceptions about Sunnis. We misunderstand one another. We hold certain preconceived you know, stereotypes about one another. And so there is a pressing need due to the amount of ignorance, the misconceptions that there are about people of various religious traditions and even within a single religious tradition, all of the misuse and the abuse of religion by some people, all of this adds up to show us that there is an urgent need for religious people especially to understand one another, to recognize one another, and to work, to work towards knowing, quote-unquote, the other. And there is practical reason for this. Why? Because we know that many times misconceptions, they lead to what? They lead to mistrust. When I don't know something about you or I misunderstand something about you, I will mistrust you. And if I mistrust you, this puts there a greater risk for me to have tension with you an antagonism with you, and God forbid even perhaps lead to violence. We find this when it comes to anti-Muslim attacks, violence against Muslims. Sometimes we hear about sisters in hijab who have been attacked by people who misunderstood. They saw a woman in hijab, immediately it clicked to them that this person represents a particular faith and their understanding of this faith is that people of this faith, they promote violence. So what do they do? Because of this misconception, there is mistrust and God forbid this leads to violence and antagonism. So there's a practical need in order to know one another so that one may be able to dispel one's misconceptions about others, others' misconceptions about oneself, and as a result, lead to decreased mistrust and decreased risk of antagonism and violence towards one another. And this is really what the Qur'an tells us, brothers and sisters, this idea of knowing each other. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the verse that I began with from Surah Al-Hujurat, verse number 13, Ya ayyuhal nas, O mankind, or O humankind, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha, wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu. We made you, God says, we made you from a male and from a female. We made you into different peoples and tribes. Li ta'arafu. So that you come to know one another. That you recognize one another. This is the reason why God made us diverse. Made us different. The whole point, God says, is for you to recognize, to know one another. And ta'arafu here, brothers and sisters, entails two-way knowledge, not one way. Because some people, they will say, yes, ahlan wa sahlan. Let my Christian, Jewish, other people, let them know about Islam and Muslims. Ahlan wa sahlan. We welcome this. But when it comes to getting to know the other, I stop short, khalas. Me, I don't need to know about anyone else. I know all there is to need to know. I don't need to know others. Ta'arafu indicates what? Indicates mutual recognition. That I recognize you and you recognize me. It goes both ways. And in fact, when we think about it, knowing others, recognizing others, in fact, it strengthens our sense and knowledge of self. If we, all that we know is ourself and our own community and our own environment, then we truly do not know ourselves. If we don't know that there is diversity out there and that there are people with differing thoughts, differing sentiments, differing beliefs and practices. I mentioned this story to some of the youth a few nights ago in our Q&A session. I'll mention it here too. It's been said that one day there were a couple of young fish who were swimming in the river and they were swimming close to the surface of the river, just below the surface. And down below there was a larger and older fish who was swimming in the opposite direction. As the fish was swimming in the opposite direction, it looked up at the two young fish and it told them, how's the water up there? Ask them, how's the water up there? The two young fish, they looked at each other, they continued swimming. Then one of them, he turned to the other and he told him, what on earth is water? What's water? If all I know is my environment, if I've never seen anything or experienced anything except what I know immediately, then I do not even know my immediate environment. I cannot appreciate what is around me immediately even. So knowing the other is also helpful to know ourselves. It gives us greater capacity to understand and to know ourselves and this brings me to the second point the first point we said is that there is an urgent need for inter and intra-faith understanding and harmony the second point now when we come to the idea of theory or theology can we come up with a theory of or a theology of religious pluralism or theological pluralism now, again, this is a very complex study. We don't have time to go into details. This is actually something um, that I'm working on myself in my PhD, on my dissertation. This is a topic that I'm looking at. I'm looking at how pre-modern scholars, Muslim scholars of various schools of thought, how they viewed right and wrong, truth and falsehood, and whether this was unique, single, whether the truth was single or whether there is a multiplicity of truth. And there's a whole debate. Inshallah, you'll have to wait for me to finish. And I can present you with some of my findings. But for the moment, what I'd like to suggest is that there have been some who have suggested that Islam accepts theological pluralism, that it views other religious traditions as also being true. 
It does not consider itself only as the exclusive owner of religious truth. Some have put forward this argument of theological or religious pluralism and they have pointed to the Quran itself. For example, they mention the verse from the Quran from Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5, verse 48. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِكُلِّنْ جَعَلْنَا مِنْكُمْ شِرْعَةً وَمِنْهَاجًا God says, for each of you, we have made a law and a way. Shira, we say Sharia. Sharia is religious law. God says, for each of you, the different groups, لِكُلِّنْ جَعَلْنَا مِنْكُمْ شِرْعَةً وَمِنْهَاجًا We have made a law and a way for each of you. And then God says, وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَجَعَلَكُمْ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا Had God desired, He would have made you into one community. وَلَكِنْ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ فِي مَا آتَاكُمْ God says. But God did not make us a single community. So the proponents of this view, they say, by divine design, God made us into different religious groups. And that all of them, they are equal in their path to God, in coming from God. This is one, one verse that is given. Another verse that is given is from Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 62. God says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَالَّذِينَ هَادُوا وَالنَّصَارَى وَالصَّابِئِينَ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ فَلَهُمْ أَجْرُهُمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ God says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا The believers, meaning the Muslims. وَالَّذِينَ هَادُوا The Jews. وَالنَّصَارَى The Christians. وَالصَّابِئِينَ The Sabians, another group. Another religious group. مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ Those who obey God or those who believe in God. وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ And the hereafter. وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا And does good deeds. فَلَهُمْ أَجْرُهُمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ Their reward is with their Lord. وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ And there is no fear for them. And there is no punishment or sadness for them. What does this mean? The proponents of this view, they say God here is explicitly saying, saying Muslims, Jews, Christians, Sabians, those who believe in God, who do good, who believe in the hereafter, God says God will reward them. And they have nothing to fear. So the proponents say this is an explicit recognition of the validity of other religious traditions besides Islam. And there are many other arguments. It's an extensive argument. This is one side. Another side has rejected this view. They have rejected the view of theological or religious pluralism. And they have argued that only Islam is true exclusively and that other religious traditions, they are false. It is unacceptable to God and they also have pointed to the Quran. For example, in chapter 3, Surah Al-Imran, God says in verse 19, إِنَّ الدِّينَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ Islam, Indeed, the religion with God is Al-Islam. Meaning what? Meaning that's the only true religion. In الدِّينَ عِنْدَ Allah Al-Islam. They have pointed to another verse also from Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse 85, where God says, وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِ غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْ and whoever adopts besides Islam as a religion, this will not be accepted of them. فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْهُ وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ And he or she will be among the losers on the, on the day of judgment. And so the proponents of this view, they have said this is clear. God says no other religion besides Islam is acceptable. Now, Yet another group have said that perhaps we can forge a middle way. Neither do we consider all religious traditions to be true in their entirety, nor 
do we promote an exclusivist kind of understanding in which only Islam is true and everything else is completely false, but we take a middle path where we admit that Islam is the truth. It is the truth by God and the final truth from God, but that this does not necessarily entail that all other religious traditions are entirely false. It does not deny at least the partial truth of other religious traditions. And they point to the Quran again in Surah Al Imran, chapter number three, verses 113 and 114. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, sawa. He's speaking about the non Muslims, the people of the book, Ahlul Kitab. Sawa. They're not all the same, God says. من أهل الكتاب أمة قائمة يتلون آيات الله آناء الليل وهم يسجدون يؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر ويأمرون بالمعروف وينهون عن المنكر ويسارعون في الخيرات وأولئك من الصالحين. God says they're not all the same. There are some from amongst Ahlul Kitab who stand up. They are upright. Ummatun qa'ima. They are upright. Yatluna ayatillah. They recite the verses and the revelations of God. Ana al-layl. Throughout the night, meaning they worship God. Wahum yasjudun. They prostrate. They also worship God. Yu'minuna billah. They believe in God. وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ The hereafter. وَيَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ They enjoin good, they prohibit evil. وَيُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ They do good deeds. They work to do good towards themselves and others. God says, وَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الصَّالِحُونَ وَأُولَئِكَ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ Excuse me. God says, these people are amongst those who are righteous. So here the argument is that in considering Islam to be the truth does not necessarily deny at least the partial truth of other religious traditions and adherence. And there's also an important point to note, brothers and sisters. And that is, and this is a social fact. Bear with me from a kind of a sociological point of view. That all religions, they have established boundaries. As social groups, every social group has established boundaries. These boundaries, they include some people and they exclude others. You cannot have a social group without any boundaries whatsoever. It doesn't make sense. Because the whole point of having a group is to maintain a particular identity. And the identity has what social scientists call the in-group and the out-group. Those who belong to the group and are considered part of it and those who are excluded and not considered part of it. This is a sociological fact. So even proponents of a more inclusive understanding of religion will, also, will still draw boundaries around religions. They will still say, this is Islam, this is Christianity, this is Judaism, and so on and so forth. So we cannot conceive of a particular group without boundaries. These ba groups, they include some and they exclude others. But what is very important to note very important to note, brothers and sisters, that to exclude someone does not necessarily mean to condemn them. Let me repeat. To exclude someone does not necessarily mean to condemn them. This is an important point for us to consider. Why? Because in the final analysis, God is the ultimate judge. Some of us, unfortunately, we have a problem 
with role-playing God. We like to play God and to decide this person is going to heaven, this person is going to hell. Right? It's as though God has made us in charge to hand out tickets, huh? To give this person a ticket to admit to heaven and this person a one-way ticket to hellfire. We're not God. God is the ultimate judge. It is the job, quote-unquote, for a lack of better term, of God to judge who is saved, who is right, who is wrong, who is rewarded, who is punished. It's not my job and your job to do that, brothers and sisters. We have to focus on ensuring our own salvation. I have to focus on ensuring that God is going to reward me and that I myself am not going to be punished for my own wrongdoings and my evils. This is what I need to focus on. Not to decide this person is going to heaven, this person is going to hell. This is God's job. God determines. And because God is the ultimate owner, Lord of the universe and judge, if God decides that he wants to forgive someone or he wants to reward someone or what have you. This is in the jurisdiction of God. It's not for me to decide. This is an important point to consider, brothers and sisters. Now, this is when it comes to relations and understanding and sort of the theory or the theology between different religious traditions. As for within the Islamic tradition, how to conceive of one another, our relationship to one another. For those within the Islamic tradition, it's important to note this, brothers and sisters, that anyone who proclaims La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad Anyone who proclaims that there is no God but a single God but Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of God this person is considered Muslim Khalas Khalas It's not for me to decide whether this person is a real Muslim or not a real Muslim if the person pronounces this, bears witness that there is no God but one God and that Muhammad is the messenger of God, this person is Muslim. And so it's important for us to keep this in mind. Yes, scholars, some theologians, they have differentiated between Islam and Iman. That Islam is one thing, that is, to bear witness that there is no God but one God and that Muhammad is the messenger of God. This brings one into the fold of Islam. But there is another level and that is Iman. And that has a special place. And Iman is rela related to the authority, the wilaya of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam. This distinction is made, but that does not mean that the one who does not believe in the authority of the Ahlul Bayt or the Imams is not considered Muslim. And same goes for the other side. The other side to decide that Shia or Kuffar or they will go to, uh, they will be punished. Why? Do we not as all Muslims proclaim that there is one God and that Muhammad is the messenger of God? And in fact, when it comes to intra-faith relations, that means relations between Muslims, among Muslims, between Sunnis and Shi'is and others within Islam, there is a greater urgency, brothers and sisters, for understanding and for dialogue and for harmony. There is a greater understanding. Because look at many of the disasters that are happening around the world, the sectarian disasters. Muslims are slaughtering each other. They're killing each other. Because so-and-so is Sunni or so-and-so is Shi'i or so-and-so is Kada, Sufi or whatever. There is greater urgency for us to understand one another, to recognize one another. This is number two. And finally, the final point, 
is regarding best practices. What are some of the best practices, the, some of the important things to consider when it comes to our inter and intra-faith engagement, when we engage with one another? What can we do to make this engagement fruitful and positive? Three things very quickly. Number one is to approach interfaith engagement, intra-faith engagement with a sense of empathy. Meaning that we try to put ourselves in the shoes of the other. We try to see things and understand things from the perspective of the other. Yes, I have my own perspective. I have my own view. But if I want to understand someone, I should try to bracket my views, not to throw them away, not to deny them, no to bracket them and try to understand the matter from the other's point of view, from their background, from their perspective. And this requires sincerity, brothers and sisters. It requires that I am sincere, that I do not have ulterior motives, that I truly try to engage with the other and listen to them and try to understand from their perspective. It requires empathy. This is number one. It requires knowledge. Empathy also requires knowledge. It requires that I take the time and make the effort to learn about others from them. You know, as Muslims, this is especially important for us as Muslims. Because as Muslims, one of the biggest complaints that we have is that non-Muslims and others, they misunderstand us because they get their knowledge from Fox News about Islam. They get their knowledge from Islamophobes, from the Islamophobia industry. They get their knowledge from all of these sources. And so they misunderstand us. They don't come to us as Muslims. They don't ask us what we believe and how we practice. This is a complaint that we have, no? So when I'm getting to know someone else, I should not fall in the same trap. I should not get to know someone from a certain angle that is necessarily anti that position, against that position. I should get to know the other from them directly, to hear them, to listen from them. They tell me what they believe in, what they practice, their point of view. This is number two. And finally, number three is that positive engagement with the religious other requires that we develop relationships, brothers and sisters. That we develop relationships with one another. We don't just learn about one another. We don't just look at things from the other's perspective, but we truly form bonds, relationships, because we know in real life that when we form a relationship with someone else, this is one of the best ways in order to reduce tension. The one who is a stranger to me, even if I know all of the information about them, they are still a stranger to me. I have not yet developed a relationship with him or her. Even if it's a relationship of acquaintance, it doesn't have to be, you know, the closest relationship. Even a relationship of acquaintance, this person who is not a stranger to me, I will not be able to feel empathy towards them. There will still remain maybe a level of mistrust and misunderstanding. This only falls when I develop a relationship with someone. When I sit down with them, when I actually talk to them, when I hear from them, when I listen to them, when I visit them, when they visit me. This breaks down barriers, barriers of tension, of animosity, of antagonism, of mistrust. And so this is important for us brothers and sisters, that we work towards developing these relationships. And it's through this that we can appreciate the diversity that we're in. Again, the Quran tells us that God made us different 
into different groups and people so that we can get to know one another. We can recognize one another. In recognizing one another, we recognize the magnanimity of God, the greatness of God as creator of all of this diversity. Tonight is the eve of Ashura. Tonight, on this night in Karbala, those who were sitting in the camp of Abi Abdullah al Hussein, the tradition it tells us that those who were in the camp of Imam Hussein alayhi salam on this night, they were preparing for the next morning, for the next day. The traditions they tell us that tonight the camp of Imam Hussein was buzzing, was buzzing with the recitation of dua. It was buzzing with prayers, with supplications, with devotion towards God. On this night, the camp of Imam Hussein, each and every member of this camp was preparing themselves. They were preparing themselves for the day of Ashura, for what would come next. The companions, they were, compar they were preparing themselves. The Ahlul Bayt alayhim as one by one they were preparing themselves. The mothers were preparing their sons. They were encouraging them and reminding them of their duty. Everyone was being prepared. Including a six month old baby. The infant of Abi Abdullah al Hussein. Abdullah, the infant, Ali al Azgar, he was also being prepared. And on the morning of Ashura, on the day of Ashura, they all went out. Each and every one of them. They fulfilled their responsibility, the companions, one by one. They went out and they fought courageously after the companions had sacrificed their lives. Bani Hashim arose one by one, one after another. They went out, they began to sacrifice their lives for the protection of Imam Hussein and for the cause of Imam Hussein alayhi salam until all of them had sacrificed themselves and all who were left were the women and the children and in Al Imam Zain al Abideen, who he himself was too ill to partake in the battle. Imam Hussein, he prepares himself to, to bid farewell. He goes to the women and the children to bid them farewell, to prepare himself to go out onto the battlefield. As he is preparing himself, his sister Zainab, she comes forth. She tells him, my dear brother Hussein, before you go out, I would like to ask you to do something. He tells her, what is it, my sister? She says, your infant son Abdullah is very thirsty. Allahu Akbar. This infant child, even this six-month-old child was prohibited from water. This child is thirsty. He is almost going to die of thirst. Oh my brother, take your child and go out to them and request for them to give him some water. So Imam Hussein takes his child. He goes out onto the battlefield. He stands before the enemies and he raises the child up in front of all of them. And he turns to them and tells them, he tells them, oh people, what you have is against me and against the men and against the adults. But what crime has this young child done? He is innocent. He has no crime. 
So why have you prohibited him from water? Why do you deny him the basic water? Please give him a few drops of water. The enemies, they say, the reports, they say that one of the enemies, he was standing there. He was ready. An archer was ready. He says, I was looking from a distance. I was looking. And when I noticed that Hussein had, was carrying his son up high, I noticed the son's neck was exposed. I shot the arrow and the arrow pierced through the neck of the infant. The infant began to struggle. He began to move his hands and feet in the hands of his father, Abi Abdullah, Imam Hussein alayhi salam. We are told that he placed his hands under the neck of, uh, of Abdullah al -Radi. He filled his hand with his blood. He tossed it to the sky and he said, Oh Allah, let this be, uh, let this be go unnoticed. It does not go unnoticed with you, Oh Allah. He, and then he says, what makes this tragedy easier for me is that all of this is seen by Allah. We are told that Imam Hussein then turns around and he goes back to the campsite. Some reports they say that his daughter comes out. She tells him, my dear father, you took my young brother out to get him water. Please, if there is any extra water left, please give to me because I am also thirsty. The reports they say at this point, Imam Hussein, he turned to his daughter. He told her, my daughter, this is your brother Ali. This is your brother Abdullah who has been slain. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon Wa sayalamu al-lazeen zalamu ala muhammadin ayyabun qalabin yanqalibun Wa al-aqibatu lil-muttaqeen صلى الله وسلم عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله صلى الله وسلم عليك وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليكم مني جميعا سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات نهدي جميعا ثواب سورة الفاتحة مع الصلوات Ahsan Sayyidna, thank you very much for that recitation and lecture. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I just want to ask for the brothers and sisters' attention for a few minutes as we have announcements for the program tonight and tomorrow morning, inshallah, for uh, Yawm al Ashir. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, first of all. Uh, I just want to remind you, inshallah, Abukra, tomorrow. Uh, is going to be the Fallah, the, the, the final day, the Ashura of Muharram. At 10 a.m. we will have English, our English program with Sayyid, inshallah, Sayyid Hadi 
Al Qazwini. Similar to tonight, tomorrow, 10 a.m., inshallah, we will have uh, the English program, followed by Sayyid Muhammad Al Qazwini with the Arabic program at 11 o'clock. So, inshallah, by noon tomorrow, the program will be uh, completed. Uh, first and foremost, we need to absolutely remind you of the CDC guidelines of maintaining the social distancing. Uh, we really please uh, beg that everybody maintain the distance. Please do not shake hands. Uh, please don't hug. Please don't congregate. If you have to have a conversation, maintain the distance. We've done so well. This is the final night, alhamdulillah. We have one more night tonight, and tomorrow we don't want anybody to get sick. Uh, inshallah, everybody will follow these guidelines. If anybody's going to get up and leave at any point from the center tonight, we ask you to exit back towards the right like you have been uh, the past few nights, inshallah. When you come in with your car, we are recommending you come in off of Holland, Sylvania, and you exit on Hill to keep the rotation going for the safety of you and everybody around you, inshallah. So please keep that in mind. And uh, we ask for you to follow these guidelines the same way you do at your work or your school or at the grocery store. Sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Uh, Sayyid Hadi al Qazwini will be having a QA session right now, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, Sayyid. Uh, in the uh, prayer hall right now, if anybody is interested, it'll be in English. Uh, he will be in there to have a discussion. Uh, okay. Tonight uh, is the final night of paying tribute to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, Aba Abdullah, who is a true living legacy. We've all been watching programs on television from all over the world of these Muharram and Ashura programs. And the one thing that we do want to mention is that the mission of this Ahlul Bayt Center is to fulfill this legacy of Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam. It's the same teachings of his father and his grandfather, peace be upon them all. And I ask that everybody pray for this center and its growth and development for our community. I ask for everybody to supplicate and recite dua in their hearts to help this center grow for us and our kids. I think we need it more than ever as our kids grow older and there's so many challenges in our community. And I know our Sayyids have spoken about this over the last few nights, but in genuinely sincerity in your heart, this is it. This is the building. This is what we have. There's not going to be another center for the longest time. This is what we have. Inshallah, we're going to build on it and grow on it and, and improve it for our children. This is a very important institution in Toledo, Ohio. So we ask for everybody's support. And this is the night we would like to mention it because tomorrow after tomorrow, everybody goes home. And who knows when we're going to see each other until the Arba'in. And if anybody says anything critical or negative about the center, that's fine. But just remind them that this is the place where they come and they can chant, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, Ali and Waliullah. There's not too many places in this country that that can happen. And me as an American born, I can see how there are so many restrictions that religion is being constrained everywhere you go. And in these walls, Alhamdulillah, we are able to accommodate over a hundred people in Toledo, Ohio. There's probably some centers in bigger cities that can't do this. And we really want to recognize the effort over the last 10 days that the brothers and sisters have done. I ask everybody to cut them a break and pray for their families and their time because it's been a challenge uh, for a lot of the brothers who, and sisters who come and keep the program going. I mean, imagine sitting on that table for 10 nights in a row, like Brother Qasim or Sister Yasmin. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of dedication. It's a lot of time away from your house, but they do it for Imam al Hussein and the message that he has uh, given and sacrificed his uh, life and family for. And as Sayyid Hadi al Qazwini has mentioned, there is an urgency for all this, right? There is an urgency for us to build and grow and support each other. Sunni, Shia, whatever background, there's enough that we have in common to forget about our differences. You know, I might break my fast in Ramadan at 7.56,
you might break your fast at 755. But at the end of the day, the bigger picture is we're all Muslims and we're all headed and aiming for the same thing, inshallah. So these are some things I'd like to share with our community. And I ask that we all be patient with each other over the next year. If you have an idea, bring it forward. And let's have a discussion about it, about how this place, this center, this, this, this bedrock of real justice and teaching of what Imam al Hussein was teaching is right here. It's right here, Holland, Sylvania, and Hill. If it's not in Detroit, it's right here. I mean, keep, if you think about that, it's in our community, 10, 15 minutes away from our houses. So I just wanted to take this time tonight to mention this, and I hope we can reflect on this. And I don't want to take any more time from Samah al Sayyid Muhammad al Qazwini. So with Thalath uh, Salawat, really loud Salawat, let's welcome Samah al Sayyid Muhammad al Qazwini. Ma'asalat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Musalli ala Muhammad.